the Rancor monster was George coming in and saying, hey, we need a big monster for this pit scene. My idea was like um, a cross between a bear and a potato. <laughs> George said he wanted it to be a man in a suit. We're going to do the best man in the suit ever. George insisted that we create um, animatics, or today they're called like previs. And I got in this Rancor suit and I played Rancor. And ultimately it didn't look that good or that dynamic. And George said, eh, you know, forget this. So it was Dennis's idea to shoot all of the Rancor pit scene as a puppet, shooting at a very highly advanced frame rate. And so I designed this Rancor as a kind of a cross between a rod puppet. There were rods that would allow the feet to walk. There were rods that came up the arms, allowed the arms to twist and the hands to open that were, that were operated by another operator. And then I would uh, drive the head of the thing. With, there was a hole in the back, and I could put my hand in its mouth, and uh, we had goo dripping from it. But the problem with, with performing any kind of nuanced performance is that you're actually performing it at three times the speed. So you got to get your brain into this space where it's like, okay, you rehearse it. So the door opens and Rancor and sees Luke and roars. And so that's how it's going to play on film. But when you actually shoot it, it's like there's a camera there and Dennis yells, uh, action and the camera operator turns the camera on and the camera goes and starts like the film just starts going through the gate and go action and then you go like okay great that was it and you know did we get it I mean who gee, you know who knows we can't we don't know until and so we shot tons and tons and tons of takes on some of this stuff you know some days we, we would go in there would be some shots that was like 70 takes. We just shot so much stuff and tried to do like different stuff that uh, you just don't know until you take a look at it. That little character was just kind of a cast off, and it was just a little hand puppety thing that Tony McVeigh just did as a, as a background piece. George asked us to come up with a name for the thing, and um, we, were, we went out to lunch, and we had a, a couple of pitchers of beer, and we were trying to come up with a name, and 
and we couldn't we couldn't think of it and we were getting up to go and my tennis shoes had come undone and I said hey wait a minute guys I gotta let's stop and wait for a minute while I under the influence of a couple pints of beer tie my shoelaces I mean shoelaces <laughs> and what that's a great name for that guy and so we pitched that to George and told him the story. And he said, no, it ain't going to be that. And then he came up with salacious, so he turned the salacious into salacious. But he was just like this guy that was just kind of, you know, anointed by George. He's going to be, you know, Jabba's little pet. And uh, that's how that came about. <laughs>
design for Java was the part of a competition. It, I mean, it wasn't a competition either. It was like it, Joe and Nilo and Ralph and I would, would come up with a bunch of different ideas. And so George picked this big kind of wormy snake-like thing that went to Stuart Freeborn and all of his guys built that in England. So it was a, a big full-scale puppet. One guy did this arm and another guy did that arm and another guy like I did the head and the mouth and then I think there was a breathing bladder and then one of the little people was in the tail and would make the, the tail move. The eyes were uh, done with the radio control, blinking and, and looking around. So it was like a, it was quite a thing. I mean, one of the problems with all of that stuff and all of the shooting and all of the puppeteering is like what happens when the ADs are getting, having the puppeteers line the puppets up to get a shot and so the camera, you know, operators can, can find the framing and all that. The puppeteer has to hold the thing up and so it can be a while, you know, that your arm's up there and invariably what would happen is you get like a camera line up and it was like, come on, let's just shoot this shot. But it's like, by that time, all the blood is like drained out of the, the performer's hand and he's like totally numb. And it's like, oh God. So some of the things were, you know, make it do more. It was like, I can't, I can't even feel my hand. So that was like one of the things that was always coming up. I think it was, um, you know, David the, the, uh, was one of the great first ADs of all time, you know, got like relatively quickly into the thing and, and would really make sure that the, the puppeteers didn't die, you know, before they had to do their work. <laughs> The Chicken Walker, uh, which made a brief appearance at Empire Strikes Back, was so successful that it showed up again in, in Jedi in a lot of shots. And that was essentially the same way as we had we'd done them before. Stop motion puppet about this big, animated one frame at a time, pretty much always shot against blue screen, except a few times where we needed a bigger one for the sort of shots where it was interacting and, destroy, and being destroyed or something like that. But most of the time it was stop motion. Between Empire and Jedi, we developed this system called Go Motion. That was all uh, XYZ stepper motors and slides that were run by computers that added motion blur to the stop motion. It became very clear that it, it, it upped the ante of believability for this kind of thing. You didn't get the same staccato kind of jerkiness that sometimes go, comes along with stop motion. In some ways, it was a precursor to um, uh, digital animation in that when you're animating a three-dimensional character on a set, you are in, in some ways sculpting in time. You're actually physically touching things and you're moving from pose to pose and frame to frame and you're moving everything along in your mind. The go motion stuff was very different. You had to like totally explode your brain and understand all the movement in terms of these axes that they were on. So it was a very much more analytical kind of a approach that you couldn't be that analytical about. The most complicated shot uh, on Jedi was this shot um, where the Ewoks are you know, winning the day and 
they chop some logs and the logs come rolling down the hill and they run into this walker and they destabilize it and the walkers are like on these logs and it, and it falls over and the go motion part of that I think took me the better part of like a month or something like that just just to figure out how to make all that pantomime work because it was just unbelievably ridiculously complicated and took a really long time to, to do, but you know, it worked. You know? Very often on the Star Wars films, they would do maybe a half dozen different designs, and then George would usually pick one. But the one that was chosen for the Tidarium shuttle, I really liked because it reminded me of Luke's Y-Wing, or Luke's Skyhopper, which was the original Y-Wing. I don't know if a lot of people know that, but if you look at it, of course, it's like an upside-down Y. Um, and that kind of triangular wing configuration of the shuttle Tidarium was very reminiscent of that ship. The shuttle Tidarium model was used in all the shots you see. There was a little panel piece or something on the nose that made it Darth Vader's. I can't remember all the details, but it was just to differentiate it from the, because there are a few of them you see in the film. And that was used for all the shots. Uh, a couple of exceptions are there's a shot where it uh, is leaving the fleet and it whoom, goes off into hyperspace. And even though the model is only about two and a half, three feet tall, that was still too big to get that hyperspace effect. So a much smaller version was built just for that shot. It was a really complex model. It had landing gear that extended. The wings, of course, folded up for when it landed. And um, although it was engineered incredibly well, we had to make the wings very, very light because the motors could only torque so much and move so much weight. And I was charged with building the wings. So I built them out of a very, very thin styrene, which was great, except if you ever go to an exhibit and see the model now, you notice that the wings are a little bit warped. And the reason for that is because they couldn't be built super sturdy. They had to be very, very light.
The B-Wing was a very, very interesting ship in that as the ship rotated, the cockpit actually compensated and stayed stationary. And this was something that was in the film. I don't think anybody really was able to see it because the, the ships were usually moving very, very quickly during the attack sequence, but it is kind of a unique feature of that ship. It was originally planned to be a much more featured ship. But unfortunately, because the wings were very, very thin, when it got pretty far away on the blue screen, the wings had a tendency to disappear. And because of that, it played a less significant role in the uh, attack on the under construction Death Star. It's a trap! There was a matte painting of the Death Star, and uh, they could kind of move in and move out, but you can't really move much on a matte painting because it's flat artwork. And George Lucas asks, he says, hey, what do you think we build the incomplete Death Star as a model? We can really move on it that way. Production would talk to me and go like, you know, well, we could do it. With, don't, don't emphasize the model. You know, we could do it with a painting because, you know, we don't want another big budget, you know, model made. So George says to me specifically, he says, Lauren, what, what do you think it's going to cost for the, if we did it as a, a full, full size model? And uh, I had known that he had bought a, a Dino Ferrari, a used one. I knew exactly how much he had paid for it. And I said, it'll cost about as much, a little bit more than the, the Dino Ferrari that you bought. And he said, is that all? Let's do it. You know, I knew that. That George had already made the decision they weren't were going to be able to change his mind now, and we went ahead and built it. Some people kind of burned out on it. Uh, Bill George at the time was a, a new employee, and he was so enthusiastic. For a while there, it was kind of the catch-all. If you were on another project and maybe your next one wasn't going to start for a few days or a week, Lorne would put you, oh, go work on the Death Star. It was this just big behemoth of a project. So people would work on it a little bit and then they'd go, just want to get away from it because it was so overwhelming. By the time I was assigned to it, 
it the form was already there it's pretty big it's about five and a half feet in diameter um, the form was there the pieces that were under construction had been cut out and what was next was all the little teeny filigree detail that represented the girders and and the under construction area and so that's the part that I kind of um, grabbed onto and took the lead on we knew from the drawings that to, to it had to look like miniature iron girders and all kinds of wire structure and everything was used to put it together so that the the inside had a structure you couldn't just cut it away and say oh, it was just a shell it wouldn't that wouldn't be a good payoff one of the ideas that Lorne had, which we ended up using, was to use acid-etched brass for a lot of that fine filigree detail. And the way that worked is you would do artwork that was sent out to a company that would, using a photographic process, uh, put a release onto a thin piece of brass and then spray it with acid. And so the areas where the release was, it wouldn't eat through. So you could get these very, very little teeny tiny details in the brass. And it was pretty easy to mass produce. So you just lay it over itself and get this really wonderful texture. And then one of the big surprises at the end was we had this piece of artwork that we were using uh, to design it. And then we were told, um, actually, this is flopped. This is backwards. So we're going to have to flop the model. So if you ever see the model in person, it is exactly the opposite of the way it appeared in the film. Yeah, well, I don't think the Empire had Wookiees in mind when they designed her, Chewie. 